Howdy y'all, the JTJ here at RollToWound.com. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Matt Robish, a proud Austin Weird Knob. He went 5-0 and at the Lone Star Open with his daughters the Canes. He's going to be discussing the tournament and his list. He's going to go into some detail of tactics, how you fight with them, how you fight against them. So if you're a daughter of Cane player or play against daughters of Cane, it's a good episode to stick around and listen to. So without further ado, let's get ready to roll. All right, everybody, I'm back. I have with the, us today Matt Robish um, from Austin, Texas. He was the winner of the Lone Star Open that just took place at GT in Allen, Texas. It's hosted by Frontline Gaming, and he took, uh, he took top in the tournament, and he did that with his daughter, Zacane. So, Matt, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so, my name is Matt Robish. I've been playing uh, Age of Sigmar since... Uh, uh, March of 2019. Um, uh, I've been playing a bunch of Total War 2 and looked through the list of races available from that game and said, so ask uh, my friend James West, a guy out of Houston, um, so which one of these would you recommend? Uh, I'm not really feeling Skaven. And he basically said, so there's a winner playing out of a General's Handbook and High Elves don't exist anymore. So the closest one is Daughters of Cain. Um, and I've just stuck to the army since then. Uh, had some fun with a couple other side projects. Uh, Looking at maybe bringing some Sylvanet to uh, GT sometime, um, but that's uh, that's how I got here. And correct me if I'm wrong, you made the Masters, uh, the Texas Masters, which is our which is our master circuit here in Texas. Um, you made the Masters when we had it uh, the year before COVID hit. We didn't have a master season last year. How how did you do at the Masters? So, like I said, I started in. Uh, about halfway through 2019 almost, so I was a little late getting into the season. And um, uh, John Napick just says, hey, go ahead and put your points in. You, you know, you show up to a tournament, we'll put them in, you don't have to do anything. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I only played games in Austin except for going down to the Slambo GT. So I barely made the cut for Masters and showed up as a big dark horse because still relatively new to the game as far as, and just been playing in Austin. Um, the good news is I think that meant no one paid much attention to me and I was able to just kind of, um, uh, come out of nowhere and, uh, sweep the Masters tournament. So it worked out to my advantage and now I've got to deal with the fact that, uh, people actually know who I am. Yeah, I remember, I think the comment was, I, I, I could be wrong. I want to say you sat on top table for a, a couple games and I remember remember people comment, well, you know, the he, he'll get knocked off or somebody something, and then it turns around and wins. And that was with your Daughters of Canes as well, right? Uh, yes, sir. And I remember when I first started playing, Daughters of Canes was a terror for me to play all through second edition. And then finally they got the new book, and it seemed for a small sliver of time, I was like, oh, good, they got a nerf. They're not going to be destroying everybody. Um, but maybe that's not the case. So the book was a strange shift, and I feel like the new book was very much a lateral move because while they did make all of the buffs that the army was reliant on much more inconsistent, they also dropped the points cost so much that you could afford some redundancy. So you could send in your first wave, and if the buffs didn't go off and you couldn't hit the, hit the way you were expecting to or you couldn't get Blessing of Cain and be basically invincible for a turn, that's okay. You had a fallback plan. If it failed again next turn, or that's when it starts getting dangerous. But just the fact that you had, um, uh, the way I've always described Dodge of Cain is that they only really have one answer to a problem. It's kick down the front door and um, uh, deal with it directly. They have one great strength. They're extremely good at kicking down doors. And I agree with that. I have uh, found that out several times on the tabletop. All right, so let's shift the gear a little bit. Um, so what have you been thinking about 3.0? It's still relatively new. It feels new to me. I'm still learning. <laughs> we're, we're, we're having discussions on Discord today about rules interactions and how certain spells work with certain models. You know. So we're all learning. But so far, what have you thought about 3.0? So the core game engine itself is a vast improvement, and I liked AOS 2. Uh, almost everything I've seen as far as trying to make the game more interactive add more layers of complexity with uh, uh, command point management. 
those have been great changes. The game's more fun. The game takes more um, uh, to really master. Those are all positive changes. The one thing I am concerned about is that some of the balance shifts are favoring things like shooting, mortal wounds, and very high armor saves. That's the sort of stuff that can be fixed in general's handbooks or in points cost changes or FAQs. So if the core engine is better and it's just a balance problem, that's a great start to an addition in my opinion. And I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying there. And I do think that as a new player, it's a little bit more difficult to, to step in. But, you know, it's about three or four games into the GT, you really started seeing to me where, man, especially with our tournament format we had, hey, even though I've lost this game, I can still make points. There's still things. And I think as long as the tournament organizers still allow you to have, a, a, it's like a points, it's, the way they compile their points is it's not just necessarily wins and losses. Wins and losses always trump. But now I'm going into turn three and four and still like, hey, I can do a couple things and still play the game. So if you like that and you, you enjoy that, I think that's better for the game. But sometimes when you're totally getting beat down and it's turn four, like <laughs> and your opponent's just sort of like, yeah, do whatever you need to do to get your points. But so as far as the tournament format itself goes, I am of two minds on that one. One, the kind of more um, uh, granu granular scores that we're able to get there um, uh, were good for differentiating who needed to land in what place because with five rounds, uh, two to the fifth powers, not 50-some players. So as evidence, we ended up with two people who were 5-0, and oh, so you needed some sort of tiebreak, and it accomplished that goal. Um, Age of Sigmar has always been a game of play the objectives. You may be tabled and win the game because you've played the objectives better than the other player, and 3.0 has not gotten rid of that at all. That's great. My one concern for the format was that I did get into several games where it had become very clear that um, uh, the game was over and decided, and my opponent just wanted to be done and take a break before the next game, and we couldn't do that because we had to figure out how many um, uh, tournament points we had. Losing the ability to concede is a bit of a problem. So I don't know where I stand on that. I think for games that are close, it's an excellent system for games where someone becomes ascendant. Um, uh, uh, basically, some sort of slaughter rule would help. And I lived through both of those examples during the tournament. Um, in my fourth round, uh, had a really good game, and the guy I pretty much tabled him. And by turn three, he had no models. And so it was just me sort of going, hey, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. But really, the whole turn three was sort of going through the motion. Next game happened to me after turn two. I was like, kind of over. I'm not trying to be, you know, I, I don't want to take away your fun and I don't want to take away your points. But at the same time, I'm sort of like, yeah, you do what you need to do. So I 100% agree. And that's going to be interesting how that works out. Of course, I think that the ruling was at the tournament, if somebody just said, hey, I'm done. Hey, good game, man. I'm leaving. That you still have the opportunity to do everything but of course that that doesn't necessarily work because if i take my general off the board and put him in a box does that count as a general slade but if you know it fifth turn instead of third turn so there's a lot of ambiguity there right and the other issue we ran into at that tournament was actually uh time i know several people who i talked to who had to figure out so we only got to turn the end of turn three or the end of turn four what do we put in for our points for turn five and that is something that the more granular you make the system, the more difficult it is to gauge where you should be at the end of next turn. And cutting your points at the current uh, current board state creates another problem as well. So those were the problems granularity created. We also saw the benefits granularity created. And yeah, that's and a super good point because I was lucky enough, I think, that it didn't matter if we finished and we didn't get to turn five for time. And then there was a couple that we were, you know, the the, um, the TOs were standing over like, hey, you know, we're ready to go to lunch. And we're like, we just, I, you know, I've started my turn. I can't not finish it. And then I can't not give my opponent some time on that as well. Um, exactly. You need to make sure both players get the same number of turns. That is absolutely the most important thing you can do. And a quick nod to um, uh, my opponents in rounds two and three, 
who hit the point where they knew that this was over and said, but can I get any extra battle tactics? And instead of just putting their head down and calling it a day, they stayed in the game and fought tooth and nail for every point they could get. And they did it with style. So well played, you guys. I need to get out to California sometime. You two made a great impression. Yeah, and I think that it really, you know, that was always in the back of my head. But it wasn't until the final pairings came out that you really looked at that and go, man, if I would have got one more, two more battle tactics, I could have jumped five, six, seven spots in the standings possibly. So that is something to keep in mind at the future GTs. And even probably locals if the scoring goes more to this method that, hey, I might have you know, you might not have won all your games or you tied. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily out of second place or third place. Um, exactly. So um, we talked a little bit about scoring. Um, was there any rulings that you agreed, dis, dis, didn't agree with either in the packet or during the tournament? Um, did that ever come up with you or your opponent or, or anything? Um, so as far as uh, judge ruling or tournament rulings, I think the one part that struck me as vague was I didn't, really understand the paint scoring system it felt like it was score it yourself by an honor system but it was vague as far as um uh, what was different tiers of score of uh, the paint scout scoring so i looked at it and said well i'd consider you know using game uh, game workshop terminology i'd be at a parade level i'm not fighting for a gold demon but i'm also not basic tabletop standard so i picked the middle one and then my paint uh, score was just taken uh, taken when they did paint evaluation, and I heard nothing else until the end of the event. So I don't know if I screwed up and should have showed up for paint scoring the next day or not. I assumed if they didn't tell me, I shouldn't. Don't worry about it. That was much the same for me. Um, I had taken, like, my army was a mix where, you know, half of my, my heroes were top notch and then i had uh you know 80 zombies that were eh, not they were you know contrast and wash so when i didn't get a call the next day i thought okay I, i'm not getting an ass back to do anything but then again i never saw any of those scores or that was none of that was relayed to me so and i didn't really ask because i wasn't too concerned i knew i wasn't i was not probably in a position for renaissance man or any of those awards so i would have liked a little bit of clarity on that as well yeah, I also looked at it as a situation where I looked around the room and said, uh, that's kid over there. All right, painting's done. All right, so um, the only last thing, you know, we, we have five missions, and these were all new missions. Um, it, just if I had, hey, what do you think about the missions? What is your first comment? What's your first thought on that? Um, Power Struggle is a very odd mission, and I would have liked some clarification. Um and honestly, this is something that we'll probably get from Games Workshop in the next FAQ that they've said is coming out in the next week or so. Um, but the way it is written, you control the objective if you, at the end of your turn and then the end of your next turn. Therefore, it counts as controlling it, and it doesn't matter what happens in between there. That's not intuitive. Yeah, I agree, and I think we've played this at a local as well, and that's sort of the way it was, um, and that's the way we played it here, where I can hold it, it's mine, and then turns around, you take it from me, but if I take it back on my turn, I've held it for two consecutive turns. And I don't know if that was intent or if that's the way they decided to do it, um, but I, I will say the one thing that I like, because all these missions are fresh and new, obviously, but I like that they were out of the GHB. It wasn't. Let me add in some cool, funky things, do this and that, because we're so early in the in the edition that I don't, and I don't really care for that too much anyway, unless you're doing something that you see is a very big problem and you're trying to fix it. But when you add in too much flavor, it can be. Right. And especially for other um, uh, websites and podcasts that are trying to aggregate um, uh, statistics, it throws those numbers off when you start adding in all of these homebrew rules on top of it. The closer you can stay to a pure game, unless you have something very specific and very publicly accepted that you want to fix, the better off you are. So I applaud them for doing that as well, especially in a new edition where we really don't have anything to say this is broken yet. I agree. And that's a good point on the, um, like, um, I guess, AOS reminders and um, War Score Builder and things like that that are taken and, and just Best Coast pairings in general that are taking all this information and trying to put it in a spreadsheet for you. So let's change um, let's change gears and let's start talking about your list. Um, I'll 
for everybody that's watching, I do have a link in the description that will have his list as well as the top threes list, a couple other lists, a couple of my opponents, and all the scoring information on a single blog post. You can find all that information there. So can you just sort of talk about your list and tell what you got in it, how you use it, and keep go from there? All right. Sounds good. So Daughters of Cain, I've always played as a... May, predominantly uh, melee focused army. So when the points changes came in 3.0, um, there was a bit of sticker shock. I'm not going to lie. My first reaction was, ah, this army's great. We can handle it. And then kind of the more I looked at it, it said, okay, this is not going to work the way I want it to. Let's try this Marathi and 15 Bloodstalkers plan where you play the army primarily as a gun line thing. Um, I did a little bit more testing with that and found that it kind of turned into uh, a similar problem to building Lumineth lists, where once you include Techless and your battle line, you don't have any points left. Marathi and the Bloodstalkers caused the same issue. So what I ended up with was uh, Mar basically leaning on the very powerful synergy between Marathi Kane, the Shadow Queen, and the Bloodstalkers. The general goal was that I have two heavy pinning pieces that if I need to throw into something, I'm guaranteed to make them survive until turn three, while I just fire multiple times with a unit that on average is going to do about 10 to 12 damage to a four up save. That strong, twice, uh, twice around at 24 inches, I can pick and choose my targets. So the rest of the list is mostly focused on ways to support that while controlling objectives. My biggest problem I ran into with test games was actually that I, when I tried to use all the support pieces I'm used to from the last um, uh, book and then last edition, this book, I couldn't afford them all. So th I ended up cutting my cauldrons, cutting all of my priests, and just playing with um, uh, uh, Bloodrack Medusa as my general to make the Bloodstalkers battle line so I could get them up to a unit of 13, or, sorry, 15. And... Uh, two units of Witch Elves to both screen and later in the game lean into uh, counterpunching. Um, for Temple Selection, it kind of came down to looking at Calibron, Hagnar, and Keltnar as my three options. I lean with Hagnar for two reasons. Uh, first, I'm very familiar with the strength of a five-up ward save, even if it's only in a bubble. And if I've got a central focus unit, even if it doesn't work on Mortal Wounds, having a five-up ward save against shooting is still powerful. Secondly, when I pulled all of my support pieces, the only real reliable buffs left in the book became um, the Blood Rites table. So moving that one turn faster let me get punished less for not having things like Witch Brew or Catechism of Murder to really drive my damage numbers to where they were. It was just hope I get Mind Razor and on a cast value of eight as, and only plus one to cast against things like Arcan or potentially the gash out there take what i can get all right and because I, I did get a chance to to check out a little bit of your last game and i have the you know i've seen your list um i, I love that you, you you managed to find some points for life takers and it looked like the doomfire warlocks tell me how you use those units specifically in your list the life takers the most valuable thing they can do is stay off the board the longer they're off the board, the longer my opponent needs to keep himself on every objective on the map. There were a few games where my opponents decided that they could afford to leave an objective, either because they had something so important that they couldn't afford to hold the objective anymore and just accepted that loss, or because it's easy to forget the reserve units are still there three turns into a meat grinder. Um, the Warlocks fill a very similar role. They're fast. They are plus one to unbind. They can, they're usually so low on target priority for the reputation they have that turn four, they're usually still operating at near full strength and they can turn into a secondary screen. Uh, Daughters of Cain in this edition, I found once their points costs were increased, have this weird um, uh, turn three collapse they do where Marathi dies, the unit you currently have engaged in combat dies, and one other unit of your opponent's choice, because they're charging you now, also dies. So you need to do enough in the first two turns to make up for the fact that once your opponent gets a third turn, this is going to turn against you. A lot of games, that's very doable, 
and you can lock in a win before that turn three collapse happens. Once it does happen, units like the Doomfire Warlocks, who have been largely ignored the whole game, or units like Life Takers, who have been off the board in reserve, suddenly get to shine and take center stage because Marathi's not on it anymore. It's just the Bloodstalkers are only shooting once. They can do one thing, but they don't want to get into melee and they don't want to charge if they can avoid it. And Minor Razors go on, so they're not even scary if they get into melee. Yeah, and I think that's it. Some of the top lists that I was seeing, and the 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 top three lists at the tournament, um, uh, especially Gavin's. Um, I even commented to him who came in third with a cities list that I love the ability to do multiple things in the list, and I think that's what you're going to have to start building. It's it's. I'm not saying that you can't just take a smashing block and say, "Hey, I'm going forward, and I'm going to do this regardless of whatever," and you're going to die because. That's what sort of giants do a little bit. But when you're looking at lists, especially cities um, and, and and a lot of the chaos and, and, and Slaves of Darkness, that you can build these lists where you have stuff that deep strikes, stuff that teleports, stuff that's fast, stuff that flies and, and does different jobs and roles. And I think that you're going to see the better players building to those lists because they can mentally handle um they can mentally handle running all that because like if you're like me, you sort of go, hey, I want five of the same thing because I can remember what that thing does and I just want to do that thing. Um, but, you know, good players are going to start building these async, I call it asynchronous warfare list where they're, they can come at you from any direction. They can do multiple things, giving the scenario or the enemy. Hey, don't sell yourself short. A lot of this is just practice and a matter of just how many, how much time do you have to get the reps in. That helps a lot, and just once you have all of your stuff off your books and off of your notes, and you're able to just do it all um, off the back of your mind because you've done this enough times, that's the biggest thing, and you're absolutely right. Once you've gotten to the point where you're just, I know what all my tools are, and you've seen, this is a problem I've already seen before, and here's the tool that usually works for that problem, Having those utility units like um, uh, Warlocks or Kinneri starts to really be important, even more so than your hammers. You are, um, this is some of the best advice I could have, and it's the best advice that I will not take because I need the next shiny, and I need the next codex, and I need the next hotness, and um, and I need to paint the next model. Um, so I'm always going to be chasing around and forgetting what I'm doing. But it, it is 100% true what you're saying because it works for me as well. When I'm, when I'm sitting here going, okay, I've had 10, 15 games with a very similar list out of the same book, I get good with it. Everything's second nature. You don't have to look up. Is that a three to hit or a four to hit on that unit? It's just the game moves faster. You know what you're doing. You're thinking less about the stats and more about what your opponent's doing and the board, and that makes you a better player. So if anybody out there can 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 take this advice, like stick with something more than two or three weeks, and you will get better with it. And to take that a step further, right off the cuff, I said my Bloodstalkers do 10 to 12 damage to a four-up save know what you do to different saves, especially a four-up save because it's a good parameter, barometer, sorry, to just scale up or down a little bit based upon what you're actually shooting at or if you've got penalties. If you know that you only do about three to four wounds to a target, don't bank your strategy on killing a five-wound hero. You might get lucky, but that's a desperation play. And knowing up front, it's probably not going to work means you put that down further in your plans where if you've got something else that's safer go for that first all right a couple more notes on your list and we're going to um uh, move on to some other questions um is there any shenanigans in your list because every list has some kind of shenanigans or some kind of thing that's weird or some kind of weird interaction if you, if you had to point to one thing in your list what is that piece of shenanigans that you have so when I print out my list for a tournament, I always put at the bottom of them a list of Daughters of Cain gotcha moments and just hand that to my opponent first and say, okay, here's what you need to worry about. You're a good guy. <laughs> Thank you. But I would say probably the biggest thing to be aware of is straight up the way Iron Heart of Cain works. Marathi only takes three damage per turn. Doesn't matter which one you hit. It only counts up to a total of three per player turn. That is something that no matter how many times I explain it or how I try to phrase it, until you see it in action, it's not always clear that, well, what if I do three to that one and three to that one? No. 
What if I hit her with Slayer of Kings? No. She takes three damage and we move along and Arcan's other attacks just are there. Um, feel free to roll them, but they don't do anything. The other big one is probably Mind Razor. It is a double damage effect on most of the army. While I'm charging, my damage one attacks become damage two, and I gain a ramp. So it's a more than 100% damage increase on most units. Um, Mirror Dance allows me to pick up and place any two heroes on the board, as long as they're only within, I think, 18 of the Medusa who's casting. Um, so just turn one, if I can't get where I want to go with the Shadow Queen, I always have a nine inch charge if I want it. Um, the other ones are just the um, uh, the Kinneri are the Kinneri. They will deep strike, they will land on your objective, and if you leave it alone, it's mine now. So there you go, guys. If you're playing against Daughters of Cain, those are your big thing to look out for. It's much like with me and when I bring Nagash and Hand of Dust, I, I usually try to say, hey, and a lot of times I give out, you know, at GTs, I'll give out a bag of snacks and go, hey, man, if I Hand of Dust your most important model, I don't, you know, sorry, no hard feelings. It's just what I do in Nagash. And speaking of that, um, I should be able to Hand of Dust Marathi. That's just my opinion. Um the reason I didn't bring her to the Austin, or sorry, the uh, Masters GT was because the old War Scroll you could. And I counted, I was expecting three Archaeons and two Nagashes and said, there's no way. She's just going to get insta killed. I'm, I'll roll tw uh, 20 Blood Sisters and do it that way. That ended up being a better plan, even though I only fought one Archaeon the whole time. Oh, and I guess the other big thing on the sheet that I should mention is that, yes, the Bloodstalkers are the core damage engine to that list. So if you fight the meta list that is 15 Bloodstalkers and Marathi, you need to be ready to deal with the Bloodstalkers. They will fire twice. That is the damage. And so those of you that have range, because the, the only way you're getting to those Bloodstalkers is with, with range fire. So if you don't have any, you're going to have to go through a couple screens or, or get close enough to with some sort of long range magic to do something. Um, so yes, take them down. And that's why we are sort of moving to a shooting meta a little bit. And I've known that since second edition, a lot of people are griping about third, but you always have to have the ability to shoot. You have to be able to, to affect units behind the combat that even if it's a 12 inch range 18 is good but yes if you're shooting 24 you got you basically can range the whole board now yes and especially with things like unleash hell the shooting units only have gotten better and you're exactly right this was something that had started probably around um uh, start of 2020 right before the pandemic when we saw Caradron Overlords, Zeech, and um, uh, Seraphon dropped in sequence. Um, so finishing up on your list, is there anything you didn't like or any changes? Say that if there was a GT tomorrow and you're fixing to pack up and go to it, are you changing your list at all? If it was tomorrow, no. I know this list and I'm not going to try to wing it with something else. It's not without its vulnerabilities. Like I've said, there are three big things I see kind of forming a rock, paper, scissors set up in um, uh, AOS 3.0. Mortal wounds beat armor, armor beats shooting, shooting beats mortal wounds to some extent. Some things fall into kind of this halfway between um, uh, paradigm. As a shooting army, I have problems with heavy armor, and that has been a recurring issue with Daughters of Cain. Um, They've always been low rend, with Mind Razor kind of being the one way that you can get some actual rend into your army. The Bloodstalkers have enough mortal wounds that it's not a slam dunk anymore, but I got lucky with my pairings. I fought one Ironclad and one Frostlord on Stonehorn, and nothing else was better than a 4-up save the entire turn. So if I gave you a month to prepare, do you think that you would change your list at all? I have a Drakaigan F list that I've kind of started fiddling with and I want to get some playtest game in. I realize that Drakaigoneth is considered one of the weaker temples in Daughters of Cain, but I think it is a reliable buff and it fixes my armor problem. Being able to get something up to two rend reliably, reliably if my razor goes off, is a big help. 
Um, the Slaughter Queen on Cauldron, I would love to get her back into my list. I love that model in the old book. And her role has been kind of supplanted by Marathi. If in Drakai Ganeth, she still has the Witch Elf trait, so she benefits from all the bonus rend. With Mind Razor, she does something like an estimated 45 damage to a 4 of save unit if you get her fully buffed. That's absurd. So there you go. That's what's coming for uh, Houston. We'll see. The list has problems in the current iteration. I need to test it and see if it actually delivers what it has for potential. All right. So going back to the tournament in general, um, did you did you how'd your list perform when when you were going to the tournament like me? I said I expect I wanted to win three games. You know that's what I was shooting for. If you win four, great. If you if you only win two, you know you're in that range. I didn't never had a doubt in my mind that um, what I was bringing was a five win. When you were sitting there building your list, did you think that you could go five and zero? Oh? No, I thought that I would hit a heavy armor list and uh, stop dead. I know that I've seen, I follow a lot of different um, uh, podcasts between things like uh, Honest Wargamer and uh, Ever Chosen, your own show. Um, and I, even, even the guys out of um, uh, uh, Houston, the, or the Harambe's Heroes podcast. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of different opinions on where things are in the meta. I don't think Daughters of Cain is the instant slam dunk list that a lot of people are making it out to be. I think it has vulnerabilities, and most of the time it'll play as a gatekeeper. I do think that it is a list that you can pick up with very little experience and pull a 3-2. That's different. Um, that said, I kind of was looking at it through this going, it's a new edition. There's no data on where anything is in the meta. I know where I feel like my army went, but I don't know where anyone else's is to compare it against. And at that point, I said, if I show up and go 3-2, I'm content. I think I can pull 4-1. 5-0 is going to take lucky breaks on matchups. I got lucky breaks on matchups. And that sort of answered my next question about your, your, your matchups. And I've said this for you know two editions that... AOS is the one reason the game is fun, and I like it, is because it's mission and matchup. And and I don't know how much now it's still mission. I know in 2.0 it was mission and matchup that I would bring a list that's like, hey, I'm really good at certain missions, not so good at others. If I get a, a good matchup for me on my hard missions, I have a good chance. If I get a hard matchup for me on my bad missions, you, you might as well just call it in because it ain't going to happen. Um what was um so just talk a little bit more about your games what was your hardest game if you had to pick out of your five games what did you think that hey i'm, I'm not going to pull this off or maybe it just was took every ounce of brain power and sweat to get through it what was that i would say game five um uh, it was ocr bone reapers which again getting panned is not working but um uh, about halfway through a podcast the ever chosen put out where matt taylor's saying yeah maybe don't write them off yet um the problem I run into is, like I said, armor. While I didn't fight anything that was a 3-up save because they were playing out of Petrifex, I did fight a 4-up save ignoring Rend 1, or sorry, ignoring the first Rend, and um, uh, that's going to be hard for me. Now, at least a lot of my army is just Rend Dash, so that ignore the first Rend didn't do as much as it could have. But I kind of went into that game knowing that if Mystic Shield ends up on three or four targets... I'm going to have a very hard time getting through any of it. My first goal needs to be to take Arcan off the map so that I don't see a wall of Mystic Shields cast. Even with that, I knew I was not going to be able to just push him off the map and call it done. Bone Reapers stick around and they're hard to remove. So it ended up being a very close game where I was sitting there going, okay, if I win priority... I'm in a pretty good spot. If I lose priority, this game gets dicier and dicier. Being able to get Arkhan off meant that I felt like the biggest check, the biggest box I needed to check had been checked. But until I finally won priority, that game went from being my advantage to being barely my advantage to being very contested. And if I had lost priority one more time, I was fairly confident that I was going to be digging myself out of a hole. And just for anybody who's wondering, that was a um, 
OCR Bone Reapers Petrifex Elite list, and it had Arcan, Alige Cavalos, Mortison Bone Shaper, three blocks of Mortec, um, 20 blocks of Mortec, and two Garth Gothasar Harvesters. Um, they had a Prismatic Palisade, and um, it was in Hunter, so I'm pretty, you know, they took Hunters for all this battle line. That, you know, and that was the fellow's name was Tristan um, Detweiler, I think. And yes, I, I saw I saw that list out there. And when you even today, when you're seeing twenty blocks of Mortec Guard with the Gothsar Harvester, that still still works. It's still there, and especially in Petrifex, where it does take away that Ren. Um, yeah, that that's a hard thing to chew through. So. I took one look at the more the Mortec guard and said the ones with the Gothasar Harvester behind them aren't going to die. Don't even try. But I need to throw Marathi in there to pin them down so they don't take my objectives. So that when I collapse on turn three, I still have most of my battle line to fight the back half of the game with. That strategy did end up seeing me through. But like I said, it was all hinging on I need a break with priority. And until I get one, this is going to slowly decay. Um. So... Well, you know, we all make mistakes, especially me. Uh, I, round two, I was looking back at my videos, and a good thing is lately I've been recording them so I can see, hey, <laughs> why did I even do this? This is the stupidest thing ever. Um, did you make any mistakes during the tournament? Did anything like that stand out to you where you went, ooh, I shouldn't have done that, and I might pay for it? Oh, everyone does. I'm, not, I'm no exception. My my game one mistake was that I – at this. At the end of my turn two movement phase, I rolled my shots for my Doomfire Warlocks, picked up my dice right next to the Kinrai um, uh, Heart Run Life Partakers that I'd forgotten to deploy, and went, oh, I had a spot they were supposed to be. It's okay, I'll do it next turn. Turn three, I finished my movement phase, started shooting with the Doomfire Warlocks because I'm excited that they were going to shoot again, and uh, as soon as I picked up my hits, I looked at the Kinrai Life Takers still off the table and said, well, they're dead now because it's turn three and I haven't deployed them yet. Whoops. Yep. Um, that is also when, and that is a good point because I have been playing a little soul blight lately and you have the option to keep stuff in the grave. And that's one of the things you've got to think about. Don't forget your own units. Um, I'd say the other big mistake I made was actually something I caught um, uh, again against the game, uh, the game against Tristan. Um, I lost priority going into turn three and was like, I get to pull an objective I'm going to pull one of the ones that is securely in your territory because I don't know that I'll be able to get there. And about two minutes after I did that, I looked up at him and said, that's not the one I should have pulled. And he agreed with me immediately and said, I was really hoping you wouldn't see that you should pull one of yours that I'm about to take. And he was right. I totally missed that and was like, oh, this might cost me. Um, I got lucky and was able to hold out with uh, exactly one witch elf on the unit and it ended up making a difference so lucky breaks do not mean that it wasn't a mistake it means that i wasn't punished for the mistake that's different um so if we picked uh, one moment out of the tournament to say hey man what uh, what stood out good bad other funny what do you what do you think i've got two if you don't mind yeah First off, uh, game two against Kyle and his Caradron Overlords list. He had a go-trek, and I had committed to it's time to kill the dwarf. I don't know if it's going to be in my hero phase. No, it's not going to be in my hero phase. Who am I kidding? I don't know if I'll get him in the shooting phase, but I've got a plan to fire my, um, my blood stalkers at him, fire them again in the shooting phase, and then if that doesn't do it, I've got a unit of witch elves. It's volume saves. That's how you kill go trek. And doing it between multiple phases means that he can't just blow a command point on um, uh, all-out defense. He's going to have to blow one in the shooting phase, one in the melee phase. And he can't do one at all in the hero phase. That's just a free shot. Uh, so I fire on him in the hero phase, put three wounds into him. Fire on him in the shooting phase, put three wounds into him. Holding about right for a guy with a three-up ward. If I'm estimating that I do about um, uh, ten wounds, shave off two-thirds of that. Three and three and a third. All right, I'm right on pace. Charge in with the witch elves. Give him 17 saves, which I say right. A three up save followed by a three up ward means that 18 saves is the exact average to kill him. Now one under that is about as close as I'm going to get. I came one short. 
And as he's picking up his dice to roll them, I go, just a heads up, this unit has bladed bufflers, and any save rolls of a six do reflect a mortal wound to you. I reflected one wound, and he failed it. <laughs> so Gotrek wiped my unit and died at the same time. I'm like, that is the most Gotrek ending I could ever see. The other crazy moment would be game three against Chris, um, uh, where I was doing fairly well, and then Marathi miscasts, takes some wounds, um, uh, and I go, okay, that's fine. It still doesn't kill her. She's only got one le wound left to take this turn, so I'll go ahead and push um, uh, Marathi Kane into combat. No big deal. This stuff happens. I win a double turn, and I pick up the dice and go, Marathi Kane has exactly one wound left. If she miscasts again, she's going to just die in my own hero phase. And I think you know where this story's going. Back-to-back <laughs> -back miscasts kill my own model. I love it. I, I don't believe she should be on the board. She is a, a detriment to the mortal realms. So good that she killed herself off and I didn't have to do it. Well, I, I told him, you know, she's uh, usually mainly a support piece, and uh, Marathi Kane is just there to cast buffs and let my Bloodstalkers shoot. So really getting her into combat, if I get any damage at all, it's mostly to pin you. And then she proceeds to high roll all her melee attacks, miscast twice, and blow herself up. I'm like, okay, ma'am, you've made your point. All right, so wrapping up the tournament like let's talk a little bit about where you're headed next what's the next uh the next big uh tournament that you're planning on attending definitely Hammerfest. um i briefly considered flying out to florida um uh, we've got a friend there from austin who uh, recently moved out there um uh, but between a, a recent trip to go visit my parents followed by a uh, traveling out for this gt uh, followed by um, uh, a league that we're doing in town here. I'm thinking I'm just going to wait it out, play some uh, local events. I want to get down to Atomic at some point. And uh, I, Zach and I did not play. There was a, uh, I think the first four rounds were matched entirely by tiebreakers and battle score. And then the fifth round was just matched purely by win-loss. And the two of us kind of looked at each other and said, we owe each other a rematch. So, or, or a match in the first place, right? Not even a rematch. So I feel like I am obligated to go there or he is obligated to come here. I don't know which, but that's a thing that we need to arrange at some point. And I prefer not to do it at GT because the last thing I want to do is grudge one of the more intimidating players and have one of us start down one. Let's save that for something more epic at the end. Yeah, and well, it's kind of funny because Gavin and Zach ended up, I think, going against each other round two, and they ended up taking – Zach beat Gavin, but then Gavin managed to climb back up and made third place overall. Anyway, Nick, going back to points and scoring, I, that, I kind of like that, that you couldn't win overall, but at the same time, you can get back from a loss. Um, Hobby, what are, you, what are you doing? Are we starting a new army? Or are we uh, just painting more elves? Or are we not painting at all? Uh, so I've got my uh, Lumineth up here right behind me. Um, uh, I'm playing them for Path to Glory League. I started collecting them when the army first launched, and gold trim is very slow to paint. Um, even slower when you start losing motivation because there's a global pandemic and you can't actually play games. So I'm using the Path to Glory League here in Austin as a uh, motivator to actually get out and um, uh, start catching up on models that have been lingering and are long overdue to uh, get on the tabletop fully finished rather than as um, uh, Wraithbone White. And that's all I got for you. I appreciate your time. Is there anything that you, um, any, any shout outs you want to throw out there? Any thank yous, I'm sorry's or heads up for anyone in the world? Um, first off is the, um, uh, the recurring shout out for the, um, uh, the sheet that uh, Jeff has put together. Um, uh, it's on the, the Weird Knobs website. Um, uh, it's just a reminder sheet for new things in the new edition. Getting to the point where that's all committed to memory, using a sheet's a good way to get to there. And until you're there, I highly recommend that and have a lot of respect for him putting, for putting the work out to get that done. And uh, it's been very well received. So I'm glad a lot of people like it. And uh, thanks, Jeff, for putting that together. All right. So I need to add that link in the description. I had actually talked to Jeffrey and told him I found it sort of organically. I didn't even know it existed. And um, I found it 
and looked at it and went, whoa, 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 this is, uh, this is weird knobs. Hold up, click, click. And I found it on y'all, the website. And then I was like, this is really well constructed. And I had a, had a 95% feeling that Jeffrey had made that. And of course I asked around and found that he did beautiful sheet in for 3.0. Um, I'll have that link in the description. You guys can go check that out if you're new, or even if you're a seasoned player, it is very helpful. It has sort of everything that you need broken down on a page, two page, like a double sider, I think. Yes, double sided. I know he usually he laminates it and recommends other people do. But even if you just print it out and flip it over, hey, it works. All right, um, Matt, I appreciate all your time. The input was super great. And guys out there, if you play Dollars of Cane or thinking about picking it up, what this man has said is 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 super is super good. So take it to heart, listen to it, think about it. If you play a lot of Daughters of Cain or expecting to see Matt at a tournament soon, um, now we've we've gleaned a little bit into his mind. So maybe that you can hold that in your back pocket and think about that. So if you see him on a matchup, but I have nothing else, sir. I appreciate your time. All right, thank you very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. All right, so everybody. Thanks for watching and y'all be good.